Ba. Che baita evento. Eu gostaria muito de falar mais português, but to express myself, I have to speak in English. I'm here to share a dream. I'm betting my career on the belief that neuroscience will bring the next big wave of technology. But for us to get there, we have to accelerate the rate of technological progress. And the core idea to that is exactly what brings us here today. Somos humanidad is the, uh, what brings us here. And what I want to say is we can all be neuroscientists. So I'm going to start with a story. I'm sitting at a table in a mountain lodge in Montana. And on the left is a technical founder of a technology company that is now public. And on my right is a partner of a famous global design firm. And the night's getting late. And the engineer says, hey, I got a riddle. And the riddle is something like yeah, four people are at a restaurant and they pay for dinner and the waitress comes back and there's an extra dollar. It's a math problem. And I'm about to answer and then the designer comes in and he said, that's a good one. And while I think about it, I've got one for you. You know traffic lights, red, yellow, green? Is the green light on the top or the bottom? And they couldn't get it. And the idea of that story is that all our minds are different. And our minds can work together, but when we think about large-scale technology, we think about people in four buckets. And somos humanidad, we can all be neuroscientists. At the end of this talk, I want us to think that we can all, we can break down these barriers and work together. And as a designer, we like to talk in metaphor and inspiration. And this talk is big. It's about what we could know. And when you think about something big and hard, let's think of a simple metaphor, and that's that everything we know can be contained inside a circle. My dad told me this years ago. And what you don't know is outside the circle. What you do know is inside the circle. And that perimeter is what you know you have to learn. Well, this talk is about that perimeter. And specifically, we need to think bigger. We need to think communities. We need to think systemically. And when you think in communities, the extension of that circle is invention and inventory. And this idea came from Joshua Foer's book, Moonwalking with Einstein. I loved his point. He said that invention and inventory come from the same Latin root, inventio. And we should look at is inven in invention is a product of inventory. Now, this makes sense. When you have the Lego pieces in your hand, you can turn it into a spaceship, a train station, a dollhouse. And what's beautiful about this model is that old invention becomes new inventory, and then you can invent more. And you can't talk about large-scale innovation without talking about the moon. And so what does the moon look like in this model? Well, it looks something like this. $180 billion, 400,000 people, 20,000 contracting companies to make this thing happen, all working towards one single vision, and that vision is that, a foot on the moon. It's so simple. Is that repeatable? We'll find out. But to contrast that, think about this. Hey, guys, uh, I'm thinking about making this operating system. I'm working on it, but you can only use this kind of computer because, well, that's all I have. What's well, Linux? And half of anything you do on the internet depends on a company, a, a computer that runs Linux. And so that model looks like this. It's distributed. Tens of thousands of people have worked together to create this product that we all use. And if you look at it, the efficiency per person is pretty similar, if not better, than the moon. So what does neuroscience look like? Well, to think about it, we have to think about what our inven inventory is right now. So I'm going to give you some examples. I want you all to go home with the invention, the inventory of your mind of thinking what neuroscience can be. So the BrainGate collaboration in the United States made this amazing story about a woman. This is a woman serving herself coffee for the first time in 15 years. She can't move anything beneath her neck, but they're reading signals from her motor cortex through something in her, in her head, and she's able to control her robotic arm to serve herself coffee. If you watch this YouTube video a little bit further, you'll see this smile on her face, and to me, that's just as meaningful as the footprint on the moon. Similarly, we have a guy who walks 100 stories on a device that reads brainwaves uh, to move an art artificial leg, and he climbs 100, 100 floors on a building. 
And not only are we beginning to read from the brain, we're now being able to write to the brain. So this is a guy feeling a handshake for the first time in years. This is brilliant work done by some scientists in Italy. And we're also looking at ways to push more information or change our brain. And so this is a company called Brainsway. And they are using magnetic pulses to affect the way our brain's working. And they're finding efficacy in helping with psychiatric disorders. And it doesn't all have to be big and fancy. This is a technology that's been around for years, but we're now getting better at processing the data. And so this is some uh, students at the Graz University of Technology. And they are playing World of Warcraft without moving a single part of their body. So this is cool, and then, but I want to get us to this question. And I'm not playing a game here, I'm very serious. What if the barriers to neuroscience weren't actually neuroscientific? Here's an example. There's a website called Kaggle, and they do algorithm competitions. So they give you some data, who can write the best math program to fix this, or to get the best number. So this is about connectomics, and they did this funny thing. They said, hey, um, click here for the data, and click here for a five-minute tutorial that has everything you need to know about neuroscience to start contributing to neuroscience. Wait, hold up. <laughs> Connectomics is the fastest growing part of neuroscience. Neuroscience itself is growing uh, exponentially. Connectomics is growing twice as fast as that. What do you mean that you only need five minutes of a video to tell you everything you need to know about neuroscience to start contributing? But that's where we are. And so let me show you some more things about how the, the, this is going to change. So, th and there's precedent for this. The Human Genome Project, a big part of what unlocked the technology was this, tech, uh, this algorithm called BLAST. Now, this, this single paper has 50,000 citations, and then another paper extended it pretty much directly, and then had another 50,000 citations. And it was just, it was computer science that unlocked a huge part of the Human Genome Project. So, why do we need, wh what is limiting us in neuroscience now? Well, we have so much data coming. This is a photo. This is a photo of a brain by some amazing scientists at Stanford. Um, Kwang Hun Chun and uh, Carl Desroth came up with a technology called Clarity. And they can make tissue completely clear. And with this, you now have gigabytes of data looking all the way through a brain to see how things connect. Misha Ahrens and his collaborator Jeremy Freeman and Janalia Farm have created this amazing technology where you can see every single neuron firing in a, a fish brain. Now, this is creating on the order of terabytes of data per afternoon, per experiment. And you can imagine that's only going to grow. Paul Allen from Microsoft fame has created something called the Allen Brain Atlas, where he's taken 20,000 genes that we know are expressed in the brain, and he's put it all online for scientists to pull down and experiment with. And then... Uh, Electron microscopy, which has been around for years, is coming on with higher and higher data rates. 100 petabytes a year can be created from a single machine taking this. And we're going all the way down to seeing the tiny little pieces of vesicles that contain the brain information. So with all this data, we have to come back and we have to think. Like we are now talking about data, we're talking about software, we're talking about digital tools that are not neuroscience. And so because we're now playing in this digital medium, we have to recognize that new digital tools have created new recipes for success. But I'm saying this in an old way. This is Times New Roman. This is 1995. Maybe this is new. New digital tools, new recipes for success. Or if you're a fan of Grumpy Cat, new recipes for success and joy. Or if Hipster has come to Brazil, then we're recipes for success by the new digital tools. And there's no better place to look at this from inspiration than Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley has put billions of dollars into experimenting with this and figuring out how to create companies from technology. And nobody will understand better than Silicon Valley in this free market model of some companies fail and some companies succeed. They will tell you better than anyone that the rate of innovation is directly proportional to the rate of experimentation. And they have learned what it means to hack. This is the Facebook credo, uh, move fast, break things. And they'll look at this, and they'll say, you know what, we, we began to break down the barriers of this. Some of the great companies were founded, you know, HP, founded by engineers, Amazon, founded by a business guy. But over time, we're finding that the best teams are the ones that are uh, connections right from the beginning, engineering and executive. That's, that's what we first saw. I mean, my last company, a business guy and a technical guy founded it. 
But we're also seeing great companies now that are built with designers first. Because people realize that design is not a bolt-on. Design is part of the process by which you find who you want to touch and how. Airbnb, founded by a designer. Designers. But now we're left with this piece in the middle, just science. Why is science by itself? Well, this is the future. And a big person who's taking us there is Sebastian Sung, Professor Sebastian Sung at MIT, now at Princeton. And he himself was originally a physicist. And then he went to Bell Labs. He wrote seminal papers on machine learning. And then he got into neuroscience. And one day he's looking at this data. And he knows machine learning better than anybody. And he says, to do this, we can find neurons in here. We can extract full, if we can look at these slices and we can find how these cells connect. And we need to know how these cells connect to tell us how the brain works. But the best computer algorithms aren't going to get us there. So he thought that we need to figure out a way to augment human intelligence and machine intelligence to discover the new parts of the brain. And so he created a game around this. And so he created this new collaboration. He brought in world-class designers, world-class engineers to create a product that got 100,000 people to go through this website and all be neuroscientists. And the work is amazing and is now producing meaningful and incredible science. And this is the kind of blend that's going to be the future of neuroscience. So let's bring it back to the circle. This is the future of neuroscience. This is the diagram. We have the brain initiative in um, the United States, where our government is putting money into that. And we have uh, the European government is also putting a lot of money in the Human Brain Project. Both big and meaningful, and we need those, we need those initiatives. But at the same time, we need to think about all the other uh, people that can now be involved. So we think about this. We think about something like this came from academia. Well, we now have companies that are being built from the ground up in brand new ways, solving the same problems. So this is a company called OpenBCI, based in New York. And they uh, made a company that was put on Kickstarter, doubled their goal, and they're, they, they are so bold to say, we can create research-grade technology at one-tenth the cost of what's been built. But what I like even more about the story is neither of those guys are neuroscientists. They're brilliant designers, they're engineers, and they love neuroscience. And because they've built something that's so good, now academia is coming to them. And artists are taking what they've built to extend that and bring the idea of, of, of neuroscience-enabled technologies to the people. This is an example. This is uh, me and my colleague David Petrino. We're working on an art project to help a paralyzed artist paint again. And we're using OpenBCI to do this. And the same idea with the brain sway technology, saying we can use big magnets to change psychiatric disorders. Well, people, entrepreneurs are taking the similar idea, and they say, well, we can do big magnets, or we can do small electrical currents. And let's put it straight into the market. And so they've created a product that helps you play video games longer by sending electrical pulses in your mind. And I think, thinking systemically, we need companies like this. Because this is testing how much people care about neuroscience. And at the same time, we have artists coming in. Because artists are often looked at as the earliest adopters of technology. So this is Mary Scahill in New York, who created uh, an exhibition where she, people can see her brainwaves on a little crystals in front of her. So what's special about today is, is the internet. This is George Church. Uh, who is a pivotal player in the Human Genome Project. And he said the internet has played a huge role in the Human Genome Project. But when he talked about the internet, that was the internet in 1993. And this is the internet now. This is a, an amazing visualization of Stack Overflow, um, which is a question and answer format. But the idea is that these new tools, these new digital tools create new recipes for success, create new ways of collaboration. And at the same time, we're looking at these huge top-down events like the Human, Bra the Human Brain Project and, and um, the, brain, uh, the, Human Gene the Human Brain Project and Brain in the United States. We also have the push to think about what can come from the bottom up. And so Corey Bargman is a very respected neuroscientist who says creative science is bottom up. And Rodney Douglas said the same thing in, when he was looking in, in the European the Human Brain Project. He said, we need variants in neuroscience. And when they say this, I don't think they're imagining just how important the maker community is to innovation in neuroscience. And so creativity. Creativity is so important. And uh, the writer of The Little Prince had this wonderful idea. He said, once you see a rock pile and you see a cathedral in it, it's no longer a rock pile. 
And that idea is what's going to break down the walls between these different sectors of people. Because the only way we're going to innovate rapidly is we're going to see us all as part of the same inventory. And this is where neuroscience is going to go. Once we're all together in this, we can charge out in all these interesting directions. And some areas need designers more than engineers. Some people need more science. But this is where the future of neuroscience can go. And I, I so deeply believe that if we can figure these ways of, these, uh, of taking these new digital tools and these new modes of collaboration, that we're going to be able to start charging into the dark just like we charge the moon. If you think about it in the 60s, the whole country of the United States was rallied around the idea of going to the moon. We, everyone stayed glued to their TV thinking about the astronauts, but also those incredible people who are making us th those things possible. We think of these mythical creatures who have these in unbelievable intelligences and these big blinking lights of million dollars of equipment behind them. But things are changing because those millions of dollars of equipment behind them, it now fits on your laptop. And for a couple hundred dollars, you can have your own, rereading your own brainwaves. And so if you get as excited as I do about what, we, what it took to go to the moon, and if you can realize that we can pack all that into a computer and any one of us can be neuroscientists, then you can think of that this is the age where we can all be rocket scientists. Obrigado.